Oh man, I'm not used to getting applause. <laughs> I could get used to it though. Good morning. Man, it is so good to be here with you guys. This to me is an honor. Uh, I'm, I'm, I feel privileged to be here. Charles is a good friend. I love Charles and Trinae. You know, one of the things I love about Charles is he is obsessed with Trinae. I, when he was up here doing announcements and I saw Trinae coming up, I was like, he's going to take a picture of her. And then he did. Hey, it really is an honor to be here. I have been praying for you guys for a, a long while now, and uh, it just feels like a privilege and a joy to be here with you. Yeah, I, I, this week I'm, I'm preaching on kingdom justice, and uh, I did preach a similar sermon last week at Valley Bible Church, and Brett, who's my best friend, we've been best friends since we were seven, which is a long time now. We grew up together, and uh, he, he said, hey, that was a good sermon. He watched it later. He said, that was a good sermon, but uh, nine points, that's a little much, isn't it? And so I took that advice from my friend Brad. I said, you're right, nine points is, is a little much. So this morning, you've got, here's the thing, it's a one-point sermon with eight subpoints. okay? <laughs> All right, it's just one point, but there's eight subpoints. And here's the one point, okay? It's just, I'm going to give it to you out front. The one point this morning, the one truth that is the, the, the big truth of this sermon is that, is that kingdom justice flows from a just king. Kingdom justice flows from a just king. This is good news for us because right now 2020 is crazy. 2020 is rough. It's, it's a hard year for just about everybody. And one of, the, one of the things that 2020 has done is it has exposed how divided we are. Right? As a people, we just see over and over again that we're divided about so much. And one area that we're really divided in is justice. What is justice? What is injustice? When we, we, you know, we're looking around at, at our land and we see video after video and picture after picture, and, and what happens when a video surfaces of a black man whose life is taken by the police? Just last two weeks ago was Jacob Blake, right? What happens is immediately there's a division. What happened? And, and we interpret it in two different ways. And, and really, the world is offering us two different visions of justice, two different ways of interpreting the world around us and, and trying to figure out what's unjust and what's just and how do we do it? How do we make justice together? Right? The two different, uh, just, just to, for simplicity's sake, on this side, you've got a vision that's, uh, I'll call it the modern vision, which is that uh, real strong emphasis on individual responsibility, right? I am responsible for my actions. Uh, I, there's the, the whole, this whole idea of systems and things like that. Forget that. It's just about this person and what this person is doing and how this person is acting, what this person has done in the past. Now, on this side, uh, the, the kind of postmodern or ultramodern view is, 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 is really more about peoples and systems and powers and oppression, right? And what happens is there's a, there's a dividing wall of hostility between these two groups, Right, and both groups, even in the church, right, this happens in the church, even in the church, both groups are saying, hey, we want to be unified, unity in Christ. So here's how we can do that, is if you would just climb over that wall and come over here to my side, we can, we can have unity. And people over here are like, no way, you got to get over here because this is the right side. Now here's the thing, church, is we don't have to choose between these two visions of justice that the world has to offer. As a matter of fact, the scriptures give us a a full picture of justice that incorporates the best of what both of those positions have to offer. As a matter of fact, we don't have to be confused about justice. We don't have to be divided about justice. We don't have to fight about justice, because here's the good news, is justice, true kingdom justice flows from a just king, from a just God. And our God is not confused. Our God is not divided. Our God is not frustrated in, in his, his, his working. He is at work and he is just, and justice flows from him. He's revealed justice to us in the scriptures. And so, so rather than fight with one another and, or be confused and frustrated and just we, we don't know what to do, we want to take a, take a scan of the scriptures here this morning. And we want to see how it is that justice flows from a just God and then what the implications of that is 
for us, for us as a church. And so we see first that kingdom justice flows from a just king. The Lord loves righteousness and justice, Psalm 35, 5 tells us. The earth is full of his unfailing love. See, see, God is a just God. And when God set the world in order, when he created the earth and, and the whole cosmos, it was created just. The scriptures have a word for that. It's shalom. Uh, shalom is translated as peace. And when we think about peace, what do we think about? We think uh, that we aren't uh, fighting anymore, right? You know, when, when, when I was growing up and there were fights in the house, I just wanted, just stop fighting. I'll settle for that. It doesn't have to be better than that. Just stop fighting, right? And that's what we've come to, to associate peace with. But what the scriptures tell us that peace is, that shalom is, is it's flourishing. It's justice. It's people in right relationship with one another and with their God, uh, working for the common good, of humanity. See, not only is this the goal that God created us for, it sources itself in God who is, who is the, the, the God of shalom, of peace. But also it, it forms a kind of plumb line for us, right? I mentioned at the beginning there are, there are really kind of two sides, you know, in the world when it comes to justice, and there's something that both sides share, and they both share a sense that things are not the way they're supposed to be. Something is lost. Something's missing. There is such a thing as injustice. That's why shalom and justice, it's like a, a plumb line for us. This is now, as a matter of fact, if you're here this morning and you're, and you're just, you're interested in God, you're seeking, you're not quite sure, this is a profound signpost. You know when you're driving along and you're on the road and you're not sure where you are and then the sign comes up and you're like, ah, I'm, I'm on the way here. The fact that every person and every culture and every time all over the globe has all shared a sense of what is just and right, think about that. This, this is a profound signpost, a profound marker that aims us to a just God who formed us, who, who created us. This is why we have a sense of, of what ought to be. We're not just space dust flying through the cosmos, right? God has made us, and God has made this earth, and God has made us for shalom, and that's why we cry out for justice when we see what happened to George Floyd or Breonna Taylor and on and on. We, we see it and we go, this is not right. This is because God is a just God, and he has made us and made the world to fit together in a just society. But it's broken. It's been lost, okay? Kingdom justice flows from a just king. And here's the first implication of that. The first implication is that kingdom justice recognizes the image of God in man. In the scriptures, we see that the kingdom, the kingdom justice that flows from a just king recognizes that you and I, regardless of our age, regardless of how much we can contribute to society, uh, how useful we are, regardless of our color of our skin or, our, or, or where we're from, we bear the stamp of the image of God. This means from, from the womb to the tomb. Psalm 139, verse 13 says this, You formed me in my inmost parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Picture the, 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 what the psalmist is trying to give us this picture of is like when we were this tiny little in the womb baby, it was God who, who like, a, like a caring you know, knitter, I think is knitting with one or two, you know, you get the picture, one, he crocheted us, he knitted us, he, he formed us, not just, not just when we were born, but in the womb. And not just like, poof, there's a person, but our inmost being, he, he formed us, he made us in his image. We see this in Genesis 1 when God says, let us make man in our image. And then, and then by the way, it's not like he makes a man 
and then woman is some secondary thing. It says he made male and female in his image so that the God of the cosmos made us, all of us, male and female, to represent him, to image him, to show what he's like. And that means that we are stamped with his, with his, his very likeness and we have dignity and value regardless of how old we are. And then also we see that that means in every ethnicity, Acts 17, 26 and 27, Paul is invited, this is the Apostle Paul, and Acts 17 tells a story. He's invited to this debate among the philosophers in Athens. And here he is in this multi-ethnic situation. Not, these are not Jewish people, the people of God. He's in, this, he's in this place, and he comes to them. And he doesn't come to them and be like, listen, y'all, y'all are just lower than us. Be like us. No, he comes to them, Acts 17, 26 and 27, and he says this. He says that God has made from one man every nation. And that word for nation is ethne. It means ethnic people. It doesn't mean like Ukraine. It means people over there and people over there and people over there. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. And he even determined beforehand where the boundaries of their dwelling place so that wherever they are, they might seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. So kingdom justice flows from a just king, which means first that we are made in the image of God. It recognizes that. So that there's justice for the unborn and the elderly, and there's justice for black and white and, and every color in the kingdom of God. The second implication of the, of the one point this morning is that kingdom justice recognizes a complexity of injustice. So when there is an injustice, like when Joseph is sold into slavery, it recognizes that this injustice is the result not just of one or two or three or ten brothers who were, had some problem with him, but there's some complex, complexity here. There's family dynamics in your environment. There's, there's corporate sin, right? The sin of, of throwing Joseph into the ditch and that story in Genesis, is, is a, it's a corporate sin. They, they own it together, even as each one of them will have to bear account individually, right? There's a complexity that, so, that, so that kingdom justice recognizes it's not just a one-for-one. One. It's not just individual responsibility or, or peoples and, and forces. And if this, there's a complex contribution to injustice. So that's the second implication. The third is this. Kingdom justice promotes community. Promotes community. Kingdom justice promotes community. This is through a few things. One is radical hospitality and generosity. Deuteronomy 24, 17 through 20 says this. You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless or take a widow's garment and pledge, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this when you reap in your harvest in your field and you forget a sheaf in the field. Don't go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. See, when God is giving his people the law, he's saying, listen, one day you're going to be out in the field. and You're going to be working in the field. You're going to be gathering stuff. And you're going to look back and you're going to go, oh, man, I missed something. And he's saying, here's what you do with that is you leave it. You leave it because kingdom justice promotes community through radical generosity and hospitality. Right? Hospitality, by the way, is not just set in the fine china. You don't have to have a nice house to be hospitable. Jesus was the most hospitable man who walked the earth, and he walked the earth without a home. Right? Jesus was hospitable to the Samaritan woman in, in John 4 by asking her to draw him water. Right? It's not about, it's not about how much stuff you have. And it's, it's about welcoming someone. It's about making someone at home where you are, right? And what God is saying in the law is he's saying, hey, you got to make a home radically for the fatherless, for the widow, for the sojourner. You leave that, you leave that. As a matter of fact, God in his sovereignty, he's saying, hey, I made you miss that so that you could be generous and hospitable to someone else. It promotes community. Also, the, another way of promoting community is is a kind of solidarity or oneness in both joy and lament. Right, so if you're, right now, if, if you wonder, how do I respond when I see injustice in my brother or my sister here in, in the Hill Church is feeling a, a certain way about that? Or when I see, or when justice happens, 
Can I, can I rejoice with my sister? Can I lament with my sister? This is, this is part of how, we, how the, the, the scriptures and kingdom of justice promotes community. Solidarity. Romans 12, 15 says to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Or one of the most powerful passages on this is 1 Corinthians 12, 26. You know, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, the, the author there is trying to show how the church is like a body and it's, we're all connected. We're all different parts of the body. And he says this, if one part of the body suffers, all suffer together. If one part of the body is honored, all rejoice together. See, even in the Psalms, we have a guidebook for how we do this. You know, a third of the Psalms, that's a lot of Psalms. A third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. Psalms where the the, the people of God come together and they just cry out and say, how long, O Lord? When will you set things right? Don't wait any longer, right? And so when we come to church and and gather together in worship, if, if Christy is leading us to sing songs of praise, we rejoice together. And if she's leading us to sing songs of lament, we lament together. And this is part of how we we, we see the community of God coming together. And the kingdom, the justice of the kingdom promotes this kind of community. So we see that through hospitality, generosity, solidarity, and joy, and lament. The fourth implication of kingdom justice flowing from a just king is that kingdom justice promotes equity. There is no partiality in the kingdom of God, right? We see this in Leviticus 24, 22. You you are to have the same law for the foreigner as the native born. This is a radical picture for 3,000, 3,500 years ago, and you've got these these different peoples, and suddenly here it is, God is giving his law, and he's saying, hey, we're not going to be like the other nations that show partiality, right? There's equity here. There's this sets, this sets apart the people of God and defines the people of God as distinct, that, that, that we are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. Our God loves all of his image bearers. Remember, this is because we, we, all come, we all bear the image of God, and so he requires equity of justice and judgment regardless of class, regardless of ethnicity. The king, kingdom justice promotes equity. The fifth implication is that kingdom justice requires responsibility. Requires responsibility. Here, there's, there's two ways that this plays out, right? And, and it corresponds, I forget which side, is the, which side is which, but corresponds to the different visions of justice. One is that it, we, kingdom justice requires corporate responsibility. Okay, so if you've, if you've wondered how is it that, that we, we are held accountable or responsible as a people, the scripture gives us some pictures of this. One is in Daniel. Chapter 9, Daniel is praying and he's repenting for the sins of his ancestors. It, he's saying, hey, my ancestors broke covenant with you, God. My ancestors perpetuated injustice. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. He's repenting for the sins of his ancestors. And then in Judges 6, there's this wild story where God punishes not just Achan for, for stealing, but Achan's whole family. What happens there is, is, is the justice of God requires a corporate account because this family produced this person and then covered up their sin and hid their sin. And so God says, hey, it's not just him that I'm going to judge. It's this family that I'm going to judge. Now, how this plays out for the Hill Church in Roanoke, that's, that's something that is going to require prayer for you. It's going to require you guys coming together as a, as a community of God and seeking his will. What does it look like for us to bear responsibility for corporate injustices in our community? So there's corporate responsibility. There's also individual, individual responsibility. Friends, this is a terrifying thing I'm going to tell you right now. But it's in the scriptures. You and I, we will be judged. We will be judged. We'll be judged according to what we do here in this life. Romans 2, 6 tells us this. It says, he will render to each according to his works. We are, now, now we are in some ways the, the, the product of our environment, but in other ways, God will hold me accountable for the things that I've done in this life. Now, that we're going to come around to some good news for that, okay? So, so if you hear that and you think, oh, no, you're right to think that. 
But there's good news. First, though, this means that God has called you and I individually to particular callings, right? This is, this is called vocation or calling. And what it means is this. God is sovereign over your placement in this world. The block you live on, the job you have, or the job you're going to have, the family you're in, God, God has called you into particular places. We see this in 1 Corinthians 7, 17 which says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. And then later in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, as a kind of summary statement, he says this, whether you eat, whether you drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. This leads us to ask questions like this, what is God calling me to in my house? What is God calling me to in my family? What is God calling me to in my, on my block, where I work, where I shop? How is God calling me to walk in, in kingdom faithfulness today, right? So, God, so Roanoke, Roanoke can be changed over time as the Hill Church and the other churches in this valley live out their calling to God in faithfulness where, where God has called them. This also means that we ask the question of God, what, what, do you, what is it that you're calling me to? And we ask the question of God, what are, what are you calling us to as a church? But we, but we probably want to step away from, you should do it this way, right? Because God is the one that has, they, they have to answer to God. God is the one that issues their, their, it tells them where to go and what to do. So we ask the question, how is God calling me to, to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly in my calling. We, we, church, we got to look to God for our serving instructions and look to one another with humble love, not with arrogant judgment. We, we want to be divided not by calling or opinion, but, but if we're going to be divided by anything in the Scriptures, we see we're divided by unrepentant sin, and sin is transgressing the law of God, the heart of God as reflected in His Scriptures. And when, when someone is unrepentant with that, they're not willing to turn away from that. That's really the only time we see division in the Scriptures. You know, Romans 14 says not to be divided by, by opinions, not to be divided by, even by conscience. I can't do this, but I can, you can do this. Romans 14, it says, no, be unified because welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Hospitality and generosity and love binds us. But how can we know our calling without a rich prayer life? Right, friends, you know, if, if, if the king is issuing, is issuing you know, papers for us, says, go and do this. This is, this is a calling I have on your life. This is how you can be faithful representatives of the kingdom justice that I'm calling you to do. How can we know if we're not in prayer? How can we know if, you know, you have been given, if you trust in Christ, the Spirit of God. And so this requires a Spirit-filled life. If you think you can do kingdom justice without, without a rich prayer life, you're mistaken. If you think, and you, as a matter of fact, he's also told us what, what he requires of us. And if, if we spend 10 times, 20 times, 100 times as much time reading the newspaper or social media as we do his word, how, how can we do kingdom justice? He's, he's, he's given us a vision for what it looks like to walk in just ways. We, we need a rich and full prayer life, engaging in God's word in a community together. All right, the sixth implication of Kingdom justice flowing from a just king is that kingdom justice promotes advocacy. So while we, while we have uh, no partiality in the kingdom, there is in the scriptures a reality that those with a voice are, are told to cry out for those without a voice. The playing field is not level. It's never been on this earth since the curse and the fall of man. And kingdom justice requires subjects of the king to advocate for those without a voice. For those who are mistreated, the king requires a sacrifice from his subjects to promote those who are experiencing injustice. Proverbs 31, 8, 9 says this. We need to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Jeremiah 22, 3 says, Protect the person who is being cheated from the one who is mistreating, especially foreigners, orphans, or widows. This, so we ask questions like this. How is it that I or we are advocating for those who are mistreated in our community? How are we speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves? What would that look like in your life or my life or the life of the Hill Church? 
Seventh implication is that kingdom justice subverts the powers of this world. See, the kingdom of God is a kingdom. Listen, it's a kingdom with power structures, right? We are subjects of the king. When the kingdom come in, comes in full, we will not see the complete deconstruction of powers. What we'll see is that we'll finally have true equity and shalom and flourishing as his image bears under our king who rules and reigns with righteousness. But until then, we live in an unjust world with unjust power structures, and the king came into this unjust world to subvert those powers, to subvert injustice, right? Listen to this. When God came to earth in Jesus Christ, his son, he came as a helpless child born to a poor family at the bottom of the social structure, right? He experienced an unjust torture and death at the hands of the religious and governmental elites. Jesus displays God laying aside his privilege and his power, his glory to identify with the weak and helpless, And yet, through the endurance of violence and human injustice, he paid the rightful penalty of humanity's sin to divine justice. This is Philippians 2 and Isaiah 53. And then he was raised to an even greater honor and to to authority to reign and rule. And Jesus takes that authority, but only after giving, giving giving it up in service to the weak and helpless. Right? We see that one day knees will bow. Every knee will bow in allegiance and worship. Tongues will confess that Jesus is king. But Jesus first came in the, in, the, in the form of a servant or a subject to the unjust powers of his time. Then he never said a mumbling word when he was on trial, trusting himself not to these unjust powers, but trusting himself ultimately to the just God, his father, the eternal justice of the father. He could have called legions of angels, said, hey, I'm going to dominate this power structure. But he of immeasurable power and worth stepped into our unjust systems and bore our just penalty. Then in Matthew 5, we see Jesus telling us how, to, how we can kind of apprentice to him, how we can live out what it looks like to, to subvert power injustices in this world, personal and corporate righteousness, so that, so that the hill church would be a city on a hill, that it would shine out the light of the good news of the gospel and season the, the community around it with the salt of the righteousness of those who are in Christ and who are living together in unity and faithful in their callings as God calls you to love justice in your community. He, he calls us to to uh, turn the other cheek, sacrificial hospitality and generosity. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. He calls us to love our enemy and trusting vengeance to God. You know, we saw this last week when Jacob Blake's mother, Julia Jackson, prayed with a police officer in the hospital and then came out and said this in her uh, press, and, and she spoke this out. She said, Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your hearts. We need healing. As I pray for my son's healing physically, emotionally, and spiritually, I've been praying even before this for the healing of our country. This is is justice in the model of the king's way. Right? Praying praying for healing and and pressing and calling out powerfully individual and corporate accountability and justice, calling for those things. Finally, kingdom justice promotes hope. And Martin Luther King Jr. famously said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, right? But here's the thing, that, for, for Martin Luther King Jr., that wasn't just a kind of pie in the sky, just, well, one day he'll, he'll do it right. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther King Jr., in the same speech, looked around at the injustices in our land with clear eyes and said, hey, racism is still present in our land, and it is the black man's burden and the white man's shame. But ultimately for Martin Luther King Jr. and, and for us now, we have hope not, not, uh, not that it's going to get better tomorrow, but that our just king will return. Our kingdom justice promotes hope. It, there is a bender of the moral arc of the universe. Right? It bends towards justice not just because, but because God is bending it. So as we pursue the vocational work, the callings that God has called us to, both you and I individually and the Hill Church, we do it knowing that it's not ultimately up to us. God is the builder of the kingdom. 
God is the one who will come again to judge the living and the dead. He's the one who will bring the new heavens and the new earth. You know, Hebrews 6 tells us that we have a hope, and our hope is with Jesus, and it's like an anchor, so that when the waves of injustice come here on, on earth, whether it's me personally or us, when the waves come, we're not blown away because our anchor is secure in Christ. And Christ is with, Jesus is with the Father in the heavenly places, and he's got a place for us. But later in Hebrews, we're, we're told to be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. See, friends, his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. He's given us the, the joy and the privilege of participating with him in a variety of callings right now to be faithful to him, our just king. And we got to do it. We have to, he has called us. He's called us in different ways to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with him. See, we have hope because we have a just king. This is why the gospel is such good news for us. See, it's good news for us because our broken relationship with a just God has a solution. It can be mended. Right? Because the truth is that you and I, see, we have kingdom justice flows from a just God, from a just king. Well, that's good news, except for that it's not, as I mentioned before. For those of us, which is all of us, who have transgressed God's law, who have, who have committed injustices, even just small injustices against our neighbor who are made in God's image. Right? When we, when we sin against our neighbor, we, we sin, it goes right through our neighbor and, and it goes to God who has made them in his image and who loves them and cares for them as a father does a child. And so all of us stand condemned by a just God. We have transgressed his law. We're condemned as a criminal and a rebel. And one day, you and I, as Romans 2 tells us, will stand before his judgment seat and give an account. What will I say? How will I defend myself? There's no, really no hope for us if when we come to that to that point, we're left to ourself, right? You cannot balance the scales of injustice with your works. And God would fail to be a just God if he didn't punish injustice. Think about that. A, a judge who lets injustice go and says, it's fine, just go keep, you, you did a lot of bad stuff, it's totally fine. That's called a corrupt judge. But the gospel is the good news. See, our God is not a corrupt judge. He's a just king. But the good news is that you and I can have confidence on that day because he has sent his son in our place, not just to be a sacrifice so that we can be forgiven, but to be an offering in our place to take our, our injustices, to take our penalty on himself, to bear the death that we're, we have we have destined for us with our, with our sin and our transgression, to take that and then to give us his righteousness. This is called justification. This is, be, this is justice vertically. God has made you just if you trust in Christ. Right? This is that passage in Romans 8 that Christy read earlier this morning, that we have a we, we can have, there's no condemnation in Christ because he's fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law in us. Well, how does he do that? Because he has given us his son's identity. And his son lived for us and died for us and rose in our place. This is good news. If you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you can be saved, right? right this morning, you can just believe in that and you have new life. And, 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 and the just king, one day when you stand before him, you won't have to say, well, here's the good stuff that I did. You'll be able to say, Jesus, it's your son. But that's not all the good news is. It's not just justice between me and God. The gospel is the good news that the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down in the broken down body of our Savior. See, when the scriptures use the word gospel, it's almost always connected to the announcement of the king has come. The king has come. It's not just the sacrifice has been made, but the king has come. It's not just that we can be forgiven. It's that, that God has now made, made us one. Across all the cultural and ethnic barriers, no, they're broken down in Christ. 
See, the good news of the gospel is that God has sent his son, Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the king. He comes to fulfill all the promises in the scriptures. He's the, he's the descendant of David, the true and righteous king, and he has come. He's the suffering a servant who's been anointed by God to be wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our sins. He's the God over all the earth who delivers his people and brings peace and gathers the nations. He's the only son of God coronated as king with power upon his resurrection. He is the risen one. He's become the refuge of the nations. He's the true God who loves justice and who clothes us with garments of salvation. He's the true king that sits on the throne of David. And all of these, these are all promises of the scriptures in the Old Testament that come together in Jesus. And by his death on the cross, he has purchased our redemption and risen from the dead. And, he's, and God has accepted his sacrifice in the, in, the, in the resurrection of Jesus. And then he sends us his spirit so that we would have new life now that's connected with the risen Jesus. We have a new life in the kingdom of God. And it will be Jesus who, after putting the world to rights, right, the, the hope for us isn't just that we got a passport to heaven, but it's that we, we, are, we are now subjects of the great king who will come and put the worlds to right again. And when he does that, he will welcome us to a banquet, Isaiah 25 tells us. And when he wel welcomes us in, he will, he will swallow death forever, and he will wipe the tears away. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and 55. The gospel is the good news that the victory of Jesus, the Messiah King for us, but also that he has, he has united us together. He has brought justice down here to the church, to his people, so that we could be united in him. It is not just vertical, but also horizontal. It binds us together. And see, see we don't have to worry anymore. He's, just, he's, he's struck the, the serpent's head. And so death doesn't dominate us anymore. The chains have been broken. We don't have to live in bondage. We don't have to live in fear, fighting our neighbors. We enter the kingdom through faith and repentance. That means to believe and grab a hold. And as I think Brett said last week, to bend the knee in allegiance to the right and true king to turn away from our trust in other things and to trust in God. And we receive his righteousness and, and we bend our knee in allegiance and apprentice our lives to him and do what he calls us to do. This gospel is the power that brings us in and keeps us in and unites us into the multi-ethnic people that was foretold in Revelation 5, 9, and 10, which says this, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is good news. This gospel is the power to save us and to finish the work that God began in us. This gospel promises that our just king will come again to put the world to rights. This gospel draws us in and unites us in very real ways in the, in the kingdom of God. This gospel breaks down the dividing wall of injustice between neighbors and binds us together and sends us out as subjects to the king to walk in justice as God calls us to. May this gospel unite us together in humble love and send us out together as responsible subjects to the king. And may his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. And as, I, as we pray, I want to pray specifically for you, the Hill Church. I want to pray for God to call you and make it clear what he's calling you to. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, you have sent your son our King. I pray for my brothers and sisters here, Lord. I thank you for them. I pray that you would, you would draw them in prayer and community to bend the knee and be ready to go wherever you want them to go. Lord, to be faithful subjects of the, of the true and right King in their neighborhoods, on their blocks, Lord, may they walk, walk 
along their street and look for opportunities to love their neighbors, to advocate for those without voices, to promote community, to, to extend radical hospitality and generosity that, that, they may, that they may welcome their neighbors in with hospitality, to make a home for them, even if it's just in a 20-minute conversation on the block or in the coffee shop, Lord. For radical generosity, even if there's not much to give, may there be a sheath left behind, Lord. God, I pray that the Hill Church would become known in this community as people who love this community as a way of loving you, who are faithful in this community to represent you and to love their neighbors as they love themselves. And Lord, we pray, I pray for this city that I love, that you would make Roanoke into a more just city, that you would, you would give leaders in this community grace, that you, would, that you would give them the grace to be more righteous, to be more just, that you would get rid of the unjust ones and bring just ones and righteous ones in, Lord. I pray that that would happen from government positions, but also just shop owners and community organizers, Lord, and fathers and mothers. Be at work, Lord. We trust you. We thank you that we have received a kingdom that is unshakable. We thank you that you are our just king. Amen.